Thank you so much to everyone who's tuned into our breakout session today. It's wonderful to have people from all over the world participating in what is such an important question at this moment, and that is, how do we disrupt the system on workplace sexual harassment? I want to thank the UN Global Compact for the invitation to join with you today. Uh, my name is Liz Broderick. I am the founder of the Champions of Change Coalition, which started almost 10 years ago now, and you'll hear more about it in the session. And I'm also the UN's Chair Rapporteur for the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. And I'm joined by colleague James. Hi, I'm James Fazzino. I convened the 2015 Champions of Change Group. I'm a non-executive director on a number of listed and unlisted companies in Australia, and I'm the former CEO of a business by the name of Insitech Pivot, which was a global explosives and fertiliser business. Great to join you today. Thanks, James. Um, here in Australia, it's customary for us to open our speaking events by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. So I'd like to recognise that today I'm joining you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and I thank them for their care and their custodianship of this land for thousands of years. I also want to open by acknowledging all those participating in this session who've been impacted by sexual harassment, those who've been subjected to this behaviour, those who have taken action or spoken out, those who have supported women and men to once again believe that work is a safe place. Among the many challenges we've faced across the globe this year, workplace sexual harassment has, has rightly drawn much attention. And for most of us, we have a strong desire to find a better way. Sometimes I close my eyes and I, I point to a, a, a map of a world and I, I say, if I, can point to any country on this map, I can tell you one thing about that country. And that is that violence against women and sexual harassment will be a problem. But 18 months ago in what was a historic leap for the world, workers, employers and nation states came together to agree on an ILO convention, which we now know as ILO convention 190 which was the first ever legally binding treaty on eliminating violence and harassment in the world of work. So whilst today we will be discussing the, the difficulties uh, uh, in a disrupting the approach, I have to say um, on that day, uh, the world took a great leap forward. So what we're gonna do in this session is to share some insights on how organizations can better prevent, pre prevent and respond to workplace sexual harassment. This disruptive approach that you'll hear about today is being progressively adopted here in Australia and has been developed through the work of the Champions of Change Coalition. Let me just tell you very briefly about that coalition. Um, the Champions of Change started about 10 years ago when here in Australia, we started to recognize that most of the rights that women had got at, by that time were rights that had been, uh, that had come about because of a collective action of women. But actually gender equality and stopping sexual harassment is about the redistribution of power, power in organizations, power in nations. And if we wanted to redistribute power, we needed to work with men, men who hold the levers of power to take the message of gender equality to other men. So what we've done here in Australia is we've, um, taken the collective action of women and we've complemented it now or that we're in the process of doing that with the collective action of men because this is not a women's issue to solve. This is a key economic and social issue and it will take every one of us to play our part. We have 17 groups of champions of change. We started with men only to help those men learn about the complexities. But now we have nearly as many fabulous senior female CEOs as men coming together to advance um, gender equality, not just here in Australia, but we now have a number of groups across the world in Pakistan, in the Philippines, and a global tech group 
uh, in the US, the UK and Europe. So the past 10 years have been about focusing on tackling gender inequality in our organisations, and we know that is a critical step to preventing sexual harassment. But we have more recently had a very strong focus directly on sexual harassment. I'm so delighted that James is um, with us today to really talk to us about that. So James, I'll just hand to you to talk about how the work on sexual harassment developed. Well, of course, we started with the substantial body of work Liz, that was already in existence on preventing harassment. And of course, most of that's been done by women. And as a CEO of Coalition, we actually looked at the issue from the viewpoint of senior business leaders. And that was in the hope that we could provide some new insights um, to that extensive layer of work. We considered, firstly, what were the lessons that we'd learnt from dealing with sexual harassment in our workplaces? And I guess we learnt what not to do rather than so much what to do. And then we asked ourselves the question, how do we change our system that allows harassment to occur in our workplaces? What we learned was there was a brutal fact, and the brutal fact was what we're being done up, up to this point in time just simply wasn't working. Our approach in Champions of Change is do what we call listen and learn. That actually means going out into our workplaces, and because it's primarily women who are harassed, asking our women what it was like to work in our organisations. We personally engaged with our employees and brought that back to the coalition. We've documented what we've learned and made it publicly available on the Champions of Change Coalition website. And it's a future directions report. We wouldn't claim we've got all the answers. The work will iterate over time. But what we are very confident about is that it is applicable across cultures and also um, across countries. Liz, before we get into the recommendations of the report, could you share some global insights about the experiences of victims? of sexual harassment, because that really underpins what's in the report. Yes, of course, James. And I suppose in my role as a UN Special Rapporteur, um, I speak to uh, uh, survivors of sexual harassment every day in my work. Um, and the sad reality is it's happening in every region of the world. At workplace, sexual harassment is deeply personal and it takes many forms, but I think there are a number of common features that underpin all stories of sexual harassment in whatever country um, I'm, I'm hearing that story. And there are things like a power imbalance, fear, embarrassment, shame. Uh, people who experience sexual harassment are silenced because often the avenues to report either they're non-existent or they're so complex and we're relying on the person who's just been harmed to actually step up and take some action. And the other thing I hear from women is, look, if I actually did step up and report it, not only would I be the victim of the incident, I'd be the victim of bringing it to the attention of management. The consequences for me would be that I would be seen as a troublemaker. I would never work in this organization again, in this sector again. Um, because my integrity would be questioned. And not only that, for most women, and with good, with good reason, they believe that nothing is ever going to change. But I think one of the things we've, I've found that can be deeply healing for people is the ability to tell your own story in your own words at a time of your choosing. That's part of healing but it's also part of helping organisations learn. It's part of the process of educating individuals and let's face it, nations, about what has to shift if we are to prevent harassment occurring. Because when people tell their personal story and they tell it with the emotion and the, just the authenticity of storytelling, um, then every one of us learns. And not only that, we become more connected to the issue, not just through our head, but also through our heart. So that's why I'm proud that one of the aspects of the work that we're discussing today and the work that's been led by the Champions of Change Coalition is the ability for individuals impacted by sexual harassment to tell their own story in their own words at a time of their own choosing. So there is no guide or approach that can help remove the complexity of the human interactions that underpin sexual harassment nor the power imbalances. 
the fact is, as we all know, those things exist because of gender inequality. So that's why anything you're doing to, to really close that gap will actually have a positive impact on preventing sexual harassment. But one thing I'd say is we need a new and disruptive approach because previous approaches have not worked. And I can say that absolutely for here in Australia. Um, they may be well-intentioned, but they have not delivered in the way that we need them to. So we need a new and disruptive approach. We need an approach where dignity and respect lies at the heart and where once again, we infuse that shared humanity or what I call the human dimension. We infuse that into our response. So the human sits at the heart of whatever organizational response we decide the world we decide to take. Because the world's changing, and so too are workplace dynamics. I sometimes meet people who are nostalgic for the old days when there was clarity about men and women's roles, when sexual harassment, you could say, was maybe just part of a game. And some have suggested that in these changing times, if those rules are changing and you're not telling me what the new rules are, caution will become the emerging script for workplace engagement. And when I think about that, that makes me really fearful because it means that women's proximity to power will become less and less. If men aren't prepared to engage in a decent, respectful way with women, if they're not prepared to help them learn and understand about you know how to build strong careers and and get you know to trade advice, um, and if they pull back on their sponsorship of women, uh, then I think women uh, will will lose out on that. So, you know what we're striving for here is human decency. We want human decency to be the currency of all human interaction in workplaces, and you can't legislate for that, not in any country. Um, our new approach cannot mandate it, but we can provide some signposts and some guidance along the way. So James, you've been a former CEO and board director. I'd love to hear from you about where organisations need to start. Well, I think we need to start exactly from what your comments are to recognise it's happening in our workplaces. It's actually happening to our people and it's happening on our watch. And just because you don't see it reported to you, it doesn't mean it it's not happening. In fact, we find under-reporting for all the in instances that you mentioned is, is rife in the workplace. The key is to own the issue. This is, in my mind, one of the most important leadership challenges we can take on. And how we respond, especially when it involves powerful leaders, powerful men, tells employees how seriously we view the issue. And the question is, are we trying to protect reputation and performance or do we place well-being at the heart of everything we do? And of course, we think well-being comes before anything in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We need to know what's happening. And that actually means that we need to ask for and demand for data. Data on number of reports, how long it takes to resolve issues, what were the actions taken? And as a lead indicator, ensure we put questions on harassment in engagement um, survey data. This has been rarely done before. So in our guide on the, on the website, we provided some principles for boards on page 30 and an example of what a reporting framework could look like based on safety on page 98. Um, and there you mentioned actually workplace health and safety, James, as an issue. And I think that's something that hasn't widely been adopted by organisations in the past. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, our view is that harassment is a safety issue. You don't have a safe workplace if you've got harassment occurring in your workplace. What we really like about that reframing is it elevates harassment to the number one issue in businesses because safety comes before everything else we do in business. It allows us to use our pre-existing safety tools to deal with harassment, which means we don't need to reinvent um, frameworks or reporting guidelines. Mm -hmm. And of course, it allows us firstly to say, let's set the standard at zero. Let's set our risk appetite at zero. Let's investigate all cases of harassment, looking for the systemic drivers of what's causing it. Let's identify risks 
put in place preventative message, um, measures, and crucially, let's intervene earlier. And let's report the incidents and share learnings. And the other thing is that um, transparency and confidentiality is really important as well. And we've seen play out across the world frustration with the persistence of sexual harassment and responses that have really failed to hold offenders accountable, um, often because of what we call non-disclosure agreements or the transparency and confidentiality provisions. Um, and I think there's been a real tension between traditional notions of confidentiality about keeping everything quiet, um, protecting the person accused, and the new expectations of accountability and transparency. And I'd be interested to hear your views on that, James. Well, Liz, we think that there's been a real shift in risk because the risk of keeping it quiet, being seen to cover up, is far greater than the risk of actually saying, yes, we have had harassment happening in our workplaces. And crucially, this is what we're doing about it. Transparency is just so important because firstly, it disempowers those who choose to harass. And it says actually, if you harass your colleagues, we will take action. And on occasion, we will name you. It says to the organisation, we are absolutely um, serious about dealing with harassment. And um, it allows us to talk about cases of harassment and learn. Now, for most of the time, transparency will mean that we report how many cases of harassment have occurred, being really visible in the action that we're taking to address it, and sharing aggregate and de-identified case studies on how we've managed harassment. I, me I mentioned that we may name, that is the exception, but where there is a public interest in naming harassers, our recommendation is that we should do that. And in fact, in Australia, you've seen a number of CEOs leave organisations and boards have said they've left because of harassment or conduct issues, which I think is a real step forward. Mm -hmm. The key in all of this is to protect the privacy of the individual who experienced sexual harassment. Firstly, ensuring they're not silenced by non-disclosure agreements and ensuring they retain the right to tell their story because as you mentioned Liz, that is often part of healing. And that is deeply um, impactful in organisations where victims are able to tell their story. We've defined seven transparency principles in our report on page 44. And importantly, all 250 members of our coalition have signed on to these principles of transparency. And, and just as a former lawyer, James, I was really interested in how we give effect to the transparency principles. And I know when we set out on this work, they were some of the most contentious parts of this disruptive approach. But I'd also say they are um, probably in terms of initiatives, they're the initiative that disrupts the most because it really changes the game away from how it's always been done. Um, and I think just in my previous roles, I've heard that you know non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, they've been criticized because they have been used as a blanket approach for shutting down sexual harassment claims cases for silencing you know victims and enabling perpetrators to move on with a career career and life without anyone being aware of behavior I mean some refer to it as you know past the perpetrator so I think non-disclosure agreements are such an important way for a person who has been sexually harassed to remain unidentified uh, unidentified and protect their provide their privacy should they decide that that's what they want to do. But that's really where the request for a, an NDA comes from. It should come from the complainant, not from the organisation because of reputational damage or from the person who's been found to have actually perpetrated the behaviour. So at the heart of, I think, what the coalition has done here, James, is about ensuring choice for the person who's been sexually harassed. They have the right to share their story if and when they choose to, uh, which as we've been saying is, is critical to them healing, but also the organization learning. So um, James, just in, in terms of that, um, one of the responses we've heard is that people in the workplace don't always know about behavior. 
Um, is that, and that's something that you've you've discovered as well. Is is that right, James? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people aren't aware of what's occurring, and so um, how do we deal with this, and how do we respond? Liz, um, is that consistent with what you have found in your work? It is, absolutely. I mean, if, you know, and of course the legislation in different countries will be quite different, but most of it will have a common element around conduct of a sexual nature, which is unwelcome. And it, it'll be somewhere around that. And then, of course, now we have the ILO 190, the kind of global normative standard setting, which will be very helpful. But I think it's one thing for the perpetrator, but it's another also another thing also for all of us who are observing that behaviour. And bystander intervention is so very important. We've seen it in all the research. Often I find that bystanders are unsure about how to respond. They don't know what's okay and what's not. It's not always clear. Some of them have not been educated. So we've seen people pull back from getting involved because the other thing the research shows is that even those who stand up for an individual who's been sexually harassed can face stigma and discrimination as a result of doing that. So our role, I think, is to help everyone understand that intervention and speaking up is an expectation, not a choice. And most organisations are so far away from having that, I think, as a fundamental. So it's one thing to have that expectation, but we need to give people the skills and the knowledge to actually do that. And that's why I think there needs to be a priority attached to employee education. This is about educating the entire workforce because sexual harassment can happen anywhere. Um, but to talk to them about what it is and what bystander intervention looks like because we want people to raise behaviour they're concerned about, um, like the practice many organisations have in relation to safety issues. I mean, if they see a workplace safety hazard somewhere, they'll be calling it out early on. And I think that same um, approach needs to shift in terms of sexual harassment as well. So we want to shift the onus from the individual who experienced the harassment to deal with... Uh, um, from that, that person to also make it an issue for bystanders, which is why I love the model on page 56 to 57 of a report, because it helps people who see or witness sexual harassment to respond appropriately. Uh, so, and, and just it, James, in, uh, in terms of your work, um, until we eradicate sexual harassment, you're, you have a strong view that the organisation can't say that safety, you know, that safeties are done, done and dusted. Absolutely. It's an immutable. You don't have a safe workplace if harassment occurs. Um, and yeah. so, and as you rightly say, the parallels are fantastic. In, in safety, we reduced incidents through bystanders. We can do exactly the same thing uh, for harassment. Yes. So sadly, um, we know that in many cases of sexual harassment, the uh, organization's treatment of a person impact actually becomes as significant um, in terms of trauma for that individual as the incident itself. I mean, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard where the, where the person said to me, look, it was enough that I was dealing with you know, the course of conduct, the incident, but what really traumatised me was the way my organisation handled it, handled it once I started to speak out about what had happened to me. So I think there are some very practical things that organisations can do immediately to improve their response. Um, firstly, as we've said before, it's about having a human-centred response rather than a legal response, because James, you would have seen yeah, I suppose in many, and in being a CEO and board director and whatever, that by the time these issues present, present, they're usually presenting either as a legal issue, a reputational um, and corporate affairs issue, or or indeed, um, you know, some kind of other industrial relations issue, rather than a human centred issue. The humanity's been sucked out of them by that time. And at that point, they're very difficult to resolve because everyone has strong vested interest. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is ensuring that the response, the organisational response is guided by the wishes of a person impacted. 
many women talk to me about, well, I made a complaint and then I have no idea what happened. I was just kind of cut out of the picture. Um, the third thing I think is organisations need to have well-trained first responders who understand sexual harassment as well as how to support people who have experienced trauma. So having that trauma-centred response is so very important. And then I think the coalition has um, developed a great model, which is on page 68 of the resource. It's, it's a great summary of what a person-centred approach looks like and how this is difficult, uh, dif how this is different from a traditional workplace response. Yeah, and Liz, we, we just leave um, the people listening in with just five messages. Firstly, own the issue, make it a leadership priority. Secondly, address sexual harassment as a safety issue because it is. Third, be transparent, empower our staff to speak up. And finally, and actually most importantly, care for those who report. Thanks, James. And just in my closing remarks then, I mean, I hope the brief conversation that James and I have had today and this brief overview has provided you with some practical ideas about how you can disrupt the system on sexual harassment in your workplace. Because it doesn't have to be the leader of the organization taking this up, it can be anyone sitting anywhere in the organization. We now know what a promising practice looks like and the coalition is happy to share um, with everyone the results of their research um, and, and and disruption. Uh, and as James said, of course, it is a work in progress. Um, we continue um, to learn as we go along, but we do encourage you to download a copy of the resource Disrupting the System from our website at championsofchangecoalition.org or to um, through the website to contact us uh, if you have any questions or comments or to also share your experiences. So thanks to everyone for being part of a conversation today. And most importantly, thank you for caring enough um, to come and attend, but also for your heroic and tireless efforts to eradicate this insidious behavior from all our workplaces. Thank you very much. Thanks, Liz.